Welcome back to the Law School Toolbox Podcast. Today, we're talking about professional development with former big law recruiter, Sadie Jones. Your Law School Toolbox host today is Allison Monahan, and typically I'm here with Lee Burgess. We're here to demystify the law school and early legal career experience so that you'll be the best law student and lawyer you can be. Together, we're the co-creators of the Law School Toolbox, the Bar Exam Toolbox, and the career-related website, Career Dicta. I also run the Girl's Guide to Law School. If you enjoy the show, please leave a review or rating on your favorite listening app. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can always reach us via the contact form on lawschooltoolbox.com, and we would love to hear from you. With that, let's get started. Welcome back to the Law School Toolbox podcast. Today, we're talking about professional development with former big law recruiter, Sadie Jones. So welcome, Sadie. Thanks for having me back. My pleasure. Now, this might come as a shock to some of our listeners, but you don't get to stop going to class when you graduate from law school. Most states, once you join the bar and become a lawyer, actually require that you do CLE, which is continuing legal education, either once a year or once every few years. And so this is obviously a really important part of your professional development. So we're going to talk about this, and then we're also going to talk about some non-CLE things that people need to be thinking about. So tell me a little bit about CLE. Like, what is it? How does it work? What do you do? That kind of thing. Well, I would say it's probably not the same in every state. Um, I'm most familiar with California, uh, but I think just using that as a basis, really it's kind of keeping up your skills in different areas and learning about things like um, mental health and substance abuse and ethics and things you really need to um, stay up on and issues that come up within the legal field. And so they want you to, you know, actively be hearing about these issues and giving you advice about how to deal with them. So I do think a lot of the topics are important. And, you know, I think it's very doable over a long period of time, you know, to do these credits, but it's the kind of thing where you want to keep up with it. So you're not, you know, left with a ton of stuff to do at the end. You want to like, think of it as part of your development as a lawyer on an ongoing basis. I think that's right. I also know mostly about this from California because thank goodness Massachusetts, the other state I was barred in actually at the time did not have a CLE requirement, which was pretty nice, I got to say. I mean, on the one hand, like, yeah, okay, this is all important and, you know, we should be taking classes and staying up to date. On the other hand, to be honest, like, it's pretty annoying when you have to sit down at the end of Mm -hmm. your three years and say, okay, have I done my hour of this? Have I done my hour of that? Um, Because some of it is dictated for you. I mean, I can't remember exactly what they require. I think it was something around 30 hours, maybe. Um, Yeah, and sometimes it changes, and it changes, like, you know, what the specific areas are. Usually there's a set number of hours, and then, you know, some of those hours have to be in specific areas. Right. So, you know, you can have more than you need in the general bucket, but you can't have less than, like, in ethics or... Um, there's one in bias, which I think is really important. Um, so things like that. And they're, they're usually just a few hours. Yeah. So there's, there are certain ones that people think are important for you to do, which you're required to do. The thing that can be kind of annoying about it, I think honestly, even more than like the doing of it is that you really need to document your own compliance. So, you know, if you go to a session, they're probably going to have a sign-in sheet for you. You're probably going to get some piece of paper at the end that shows that you were there. Like, you have to keep track of all that stuff. Um, Yes. You know, at the end of three years, you can't just be like, oh, I remember I went to this thing. And yeah, it was like about three hours. Like, there are really strict requirements for if you're doing a presentation for getting CLE and what type of CLE you get and how many hours you get. So you've really got to be on top of this over the period of time or you're going to end up in a world of hate at the end of it. Yes. And and something I'd bring up, uh, what you just mentioned about how there'll be a sign-in sheet and you'll get a piece of paper. I think that some people are confused that they think the sign-in sheet is somehow going to be recorded for them. Right. You know, because you've signed in. Right. Really, the sign-in sheet is for the person giving the CLE, that they can actually authorize it because they need to turn in certain materials to say it is CLE. But you keeping that piece of paper is 100% your responsibility. And I've never been anywhere where they keep pieces of paper for you, like as 
as a firm or as an employer. No, I think that's right. I mean, you need to have some sort of process for keeping track of this stuff, whether it's that you have a certain folder that you put all of this stuff into or whether you immediately take a picture of it and you file it in a certain Dropbox folder. You know, you got to have something so that when you go back two and a half years from now, you know, you're not sitting there going, oh my gosh, like where is that piece of paper? Obviously, you're never going to find it again. <laughs> as soon as you... As soon as you start getting these, you've got to keep track of them. Absolutely. And I think there are people who have assistants, you know, maybe you have a secretary and, you know, maybe it is okay that you hand it them and tell them to put it in a file, but I actually think it's better that you take this on yourself or know exactly where the file is and check on it because I have seen a lot of mishaps with things like that. Yeah. I mean, what if your secretary leaves and they don't remember yeah. to tell someone where the thing is and then suddenly you're missing two years of CLE credits? Like, you know, this primarily is your responsibility. So, and I think doing it electronically just makes a ton of sense. I mean, what if the building burns down and your only copy is that one folder? I mean, it's just not a great situation to be in absolutely and it doesn't need to be an original document or anything you just need you know that piece of paper and that you've signed it and, and everything so yes yeah, that's so, completely fine yeah i mean you might track it on a spreadsheet and then just have a link or whatever i mean this is not rocket science but <laughs> it's, just, it's just you've got to keep up with this stuff or you're and and what I'd add is, I think people also may not realize that when you actually report it, it's you who usually goes into a system online and reports that you've done your CLE by a certain date. Um, and it is the honor system in terms of that. I would make sure you went through and looked through everything, made sure that you had it, um, you know, did it. The thing where it can come around again is that they do audits right. every single year. And I've seen a ton of attorneys get audited. And that's where they come back and check all your forms. So maybe they won't. But if they do and you don't have it, it is a really big deal. Right. I mean, essentially, I would say that's probably an ethical violation at that point. I mean, yeah. you've essentially lied about doing your continuing legal education. It's not going to put you in a very nice spot with the bar exam. Or I'm sorry, with exactly. the bar examiners. So that's why you really want to have copies of everything. You know, it's like your taxes. You know, you don't you don't want it to be a problem if it comes Yeah, around. exactly. Like most likely nobody's ever going to ask, but if they do ask, you need to be able to document this. I think yeah. I can't remember. I might have gotten audited once randomly in California. I know it's kind of a nightmare. Yeah, I can't <laughs> really heard. remember. Um, Unless you were very organized. Yeah, I mean, I legitimately like had done it and had all the copies of everything, but it still was like, "Oh my gosh, like what is going on here?" All right, well, let's talk a little bit about how people can fill these CLE requirements because it sounds like kind of a big deal. Yes. Well, I think there's lots of things that you can do to fill these without even realizing it sometimes. Um, so if you're you know, a licensed attorney, you get invited to events or, for example, your local bar association, things like that. Um, there's sometimes there are dinners where there's a speaker. Oh, those are the best. Available. Yeah. So then, you know, it's free food. <laughs> yeah, it's like somebody's paying it's, for you to eat. Yeah, pretty nice exactly. food. You're networking. And you get an hour of CLE credit. You're like, yes. But you need to probably follow up to get the piece of paper. This is where people go wrong. You know, it's like you just being there doesn't give you the CLE. Mm. You have to actually get the credit for it. So just remember. But I would say... Look at these kind of these events, these seminars, these talks, whatever. See if they say they're CLE available. If it sounds like something, you know, that might be CLE eligible, you could ask if for some reason they didn't write it down. Um, aside from that, a lot of big firms and, and maybe even smaller firms um, have CLE events. Um, so they're specifically maybe hosting something where they bring in clients also, mm -hmm. and they're trying to provide CLE. And it especially comes up towards the end. Right. When everyone's like, <laughs> everyone's scrambling to get their CLE done. Yeah. <laughs> so you get clients in, you know, they get some CLE for it. So look for those. I would say a lot of your internal trainings um, have CLE credits. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, actually showing up for these meetings can get you something aside from, you know, hopefully learning something. Uh, so there's some examples. There's also lots of ways to get it online. Mm -hmm. um, so there's PLI that I know at firms I've been at, there's free access for all the attorneys. So basically you log in and you can do all sorts of, you know, they, programs. They have basically CLE on about everything you could think of, really. Yeah. And so I would say that if you can get more of the in-person events, it's probably more interesting, um, you know, than just trying to get them all done at the end. 
you know, online, but that's an easy way to do it. Um, so usually there are requirements about how many hours you can do active versus passive. And so just make sure you know how many hours you've already done, uh, you know, that maybe are just online where you're just clicking a button and going through something. Cause usually there's only about half of the hours that are allowed to be done that way. Mm -hmm. And there are some online programs where they're like recordings of live things those are considered active also. But I would keep track of that. Yeah, you definitely need to keep track of, you know, that you're meeting whatever requirements there are in your state. Uh, sometimes, too, things like PLI have free pro bono options. So that could actually be a really good way to do it if you just need to fill some hours, don't really want to pay for it. Um, you know, you can learn something interesting and you might be able to do it online in the comfort of your home. Another place that people sometimes don't really think about that you can really get some good CLE credits are at conferences. So if there's a conference, you know, in your area of interest, this is a great opportunity to do some networking, maybe have some nice food, and also learn something and get some credit for it. So I think you do have a lot of options. I mean, sometimes even local schools will have lunch events or evening events that you can go to, and those are CLE eligible. In fact, another thing you can do is if you find yourself teaching CLE for whatever reason, at say at a law school, you know, you're teaching a class or something like that, or you're teaching some sort of professional development class for young lawyers, that actually gets you a ton of CLE because you get to be the teacher and give yourself the credit, basically. Yeah, and you get to like multiply it. I can't remember the exact math, but I've done it before. Um, so you get more hours right. than the hours you're actually doing, doing stuff yeah. like that. And sometimes you also can get hours for preparing for it. Right, so, so they give you like credit basically for the work that you do to put on this presentation, which can be pretty awesome. Yeah, and I know, you know, at firms I've worked at, we would always be trying to get attorneys in, like, to do a presentation at a law school, and we would advertise it that way, you know, so don't ignore those things. It's, like, a great opportunity. Yeah, and that, you know, that touches on some other important professional opportunities, professional development activities that we're going to talk about, where it's not just you increasing your knowledge in a certain area or checking a box. Like, there are a lot of other things you need to be doing for your own professional development. And let's talk about that. I mean, you've worked at a lot of law firms. I always kind of had the impression people sort of thought that somebody else was going to make these choices for them about what they should be doing. Is that true? Uh, I don't think that's true. <laughs> and I think it might be advertised to you that way. But I think in reality, you know, you're responsible for your career. Right. And you're responsible for your development. So hopefully the place you work are giving you ideas of, you know, different benchmarks that you should be hit hitting, you know, as you move through your career. But if you're not hitting them, there isn't necessarily someone who's going to say, oh, you haven't done a deposition. How do we make that happen? Right. You need to actively say, I haven't done a deposition. I'm a fifth year. You know, I really need to, you know, figure this out. Is there a pro bono opportunity or something? Um, so that's just an example of where I think that you have to take your career into your own hands and make sure that you're asking for things that you feel like you need to get to the next step. I think that's right. And I think that applies regardless of the type of job that you're in. I mean, it's very easy for people just to kind of put their heads down and do their day to day work and not really think about, you know, am I doing the things I want to do to progress to the next step in my career. And, you know, the reality is you're probably not going to stay at that first job, whatever it is for your entire career. So, you know, at some point you're going to be that person who is advocating for yourself, you know, when you're doing a job interview or whatever and saying, oh, you know, I have taken depositions. I have written this brief. You know, I have done this type of thing that I should have done, you know, to be useful at the point I'm in my career. And that's really up to you. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, there may be things available to you where you work, you know, hopefully that you've been given a mentor or you found a mentor, right? Um, which I always recommend also, um, you know, a lot of places do assign mentors, but I also think that you'll have informal mentors. I think we've all had that. Sure. People we connect with um, who are more senior. And so I think it's good that you as a younger attorney maybe suggest on a quarterly basis, let's go out for lunch and could we talk about my career and where I am? 
I think absolutely. And that person doesn't have to be at your workplace either. You know, if you're mm-hmm. out in the community doing some CLE credits, say on site, obviously the other people in that room are probably interested in the same things and you might start chatting at a coffee break. Maybe you get their email for the person that you thought, you know, seemed the most receptive or the most interesting. And you say, oh, you know, I'd love to take you for coffee and really hear about your career or whatever. Um, you know, maybe you send an occasional follow-up article. I saw this. I thought you might find it interesting. So that you become that person that they have an interest in and, you know, they might be willing to help you along the way. Absolutely. And the same thing with pro bono. I mean, you mentioned you know, getting different skills through pro bono. It's also a great way to get, to get mentors in a certain area. So I, I remember... I remember when I was thinking of leaving the firm, I was like, oh, you know, maybe I want to do something else. And I took a family law case and they gave me basically a list of all the top family lawyers in San Francisco. And we're like, oh, if you have any questions, you know, you can reach out to these people for helping. And of course I reached out to them, you know, (laughs) like, um, I basically went down the list and was like, oh, this person looks interesting. They're successful. You know, they're running their own practice. Like, hmm, let me see if she'll help me on my case. You know, so I went and actually had a meeting in her office. And after about five minutes of discussing the case, which frankly wasn't that complicated, you know, she was sort of like, well, like, tell me about your career. Like, what are you thinking? Why are you still at a firm? And I was like, well, actually, I'm thinking of leaving and maybe I want to do what you do. And then we spent 30 minutes talking about that. You know, that's amazing. And I think that's a great example of, you know, you taking ownership because I think a lot of people, you know, aren't thinking ahead like that. Right. I think you need to be strategic here. Mm -hmm. Um, And you also just don't know where contacts are going to come from. So I know Lee, for example, she was on the board of a nonprofit and, you know, made tons of interesting connections that way and mentors and people who were willing to help in and outside of the legal profession. You know, a lot of those people who are on the board with her maybe were business people, not lawyers. So, you know, thinking a little more broadly about how to build that network of people that can help in your professional development, I think it's something you want to be start thinking about early. I mean, obviously you can't just join the board of an organization immediately. Right. You probably need to go and, you know, maybe go to their benefit and then you start volunteering and then, you know, maybe you're a board member, you know, or you're whatever you lead and or lead some sort of event. And then they're like, oh, this person seems great. You know, do you want to be on the board? But that's probably going to take you a little while. I agree. I think getting in early for opportunities, you know, when you're a younger lawyer um, so that you can build it up later. Uh, I also think look to the people that maybe have a career you're interested in. Mm -hmm. So you see that, you know, they have or or I would even say more broadly, a life you're interested in. Right. You know, does it seem like they have the balance you're looking for and are they doing interesting work, but they still have a personal life and that sort of thing. And I think those are the people to reach out to and kind of figure out how did you get here? Yeah, exactly. It doesn't have to be like, oh, this person is the managing partner of a firm. You might look mm-hmm. at them and be like, yeah, but they're, you know, on their third spouse and never see their children. You know, <laughs> like, that's not what yeah. I want. Um All right, so let's go back to this thing you mentioned about benchmarks. What do you mean by that? Uh, Well, I think at at firms I've been at, at least, um, usually they're they're pretty clearly laid out for different either class years or maybe like a section of class years. So maybe, you know, first through third year, third through sixth year, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, Because it's not necessarily that each year you've developed, you know, a large new skill. Right. You know, it's something that can kind of cover like your junior time, your mid time, your senior time. Um, And I would say that they're probably different depending on your practice area. For sure. I mean, obviously, if you're a corporate corporate, like M&A deals, you're not doing depositions. It's just not relevant. Exactly. Exactly. But if we're talking about, let's say, litigation, um, you know, so taking a deposition, you know, by a certain point is probably a benchmark, Mm -hmm. you know, and it's also not, I don't think it's like you have to feel like you failed at your career if you haven't gotten there yet. And maybe there are reasons you haven't gotten there. Um, But I also do think it's on you. And the reason I use the example of um, of looking for pro bono work is because sometimes it can be hard, especially at a big firm, to get that experience um, right. on a client case early. Um, but but usually, you know, you have more opportunity on a pro bono case earlier. Um, so that's, you know, one example. Uh, but there's lots of different, you know, 
points you want to have hit by a certain time. Otherwise, you know, you may not be developing right. at the rate you want to be. Yeah, I mean, you don't want to just be sort of heads down doing the same thing day after day after day. Like you want to be moving forward and developing your skills as a lawyer because who knows where that's going to take you. Exactly. You want to feel like you've had actual experience in court, um, you know, by a certain point, if, if that's what you're looking for. Right. And some of this stuff actually is much easier outside of a firm. You know, if you go work for yes. the DA's office or the public defenders, you're going to have court experience from day one, <laughs> like literally. And you know? I would say um, a lot of firms have opportunities for you to go and work in those places. Right. Um, they're hard to get. So I wouldn't, you know, say that that's an easy thing. But a lot of people do you know, take those opportunities at firms, even though they're stepping away from the firm, maybe for six months or a year, and that can be hard. Um, But they know they're going to get all of this experience, they're going to do trials, Um, you know, that sort of thing. So I think look at every opportunity that might be available for you and put your name out there. Yeah, I mean, sometimes it's almost like a sabbatical to go get this experience. Or I think on the corporate side, um, what do they call them? Secondments. 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 Yeah. Where what? What is that? Uh, you can work in house for a client, right? Let's say for six months for a year. And I will say that I know a lot of people that got jobs out of that. Um, you know, and maybe not right away, but they made enough connections that down the road, you know, they found an in house position. Yeah, I think that's a really good option if you're on the corporate side to take advantage of. I mean, a, it can just be kind of fun. I think of one of my law school classmates like did a secondment in Japan at some client, which wow. sounded amazing. Um, yeah, so it's just an opportunity to basically go and work somewhere else and really be there day to day and make those connections and get that experience and do that professional development so that, you know, you're basically leveling up. You're doing something that other people are not doing. And of course, it's going to put you on a different trajectory. Uh, and I would say in terms of the benchmarks or these different things we're talking about, um, you know, I, I think most people kind of figure them out based on, you know, where they see most of their associates are at a certain point. Mm-hmm. Um, not everybody is, but I think you do want to feel like you're hitting the points that other people in your class year are, because if you leave that firm and either want to go to another firm or go in house or work at a government job, you're competing against other people who right. are at your level. So you don't want to feel like you're you know, not at the same point they are, but looking at the same kind of jobs. Right. So, I mean, you mentioned doing, trying to take a pro bono case, you know, probably strategically to get some experience. What are some other things people can do or people they can talk to if they feel like they're not really hitting these benchmarks and not being where they should be in terms of their professional development? Well, I would say that I would hope they're somewhere where they're getting reviews regularly um, and and this stuff is coming up. Um, It may not be. In which case, I would say there are probably people who work, uh, if you work at a firm, in professional development. Um, So there are staff members that that's their whole job. So you can talk to them about where to start. You can also talk to a mentor. So either an assigned mentor or, um, you know, if you have developed a relationship, a mentoring relationship at the place you work. Um, You could also talk to someone who has a leadership position in your practice group, I think is always a good idea. Um, I will say, I mean, it probably depends on the person. Not every, like, head of litigation really wants to talk to a third year, you know, about their experience. But I think there are people that, you know, that appreciate that. And I would say that most of the time, you don't find junior associates like actively talking about this and wanting that experience. And I think that a lot of partners would be impressed. I agree. With you saying that you feel like you're not quite where you want to be. Do they have any suggestions of how you, you know, is there someone that you they can work with? Where do they think that you could learn these skills? Yeah, and I think you just have to, you know, you have to approach it productively. So the conversation... Maybe along the lines of, hey, you know, these are some things that I would be interested in doing in the next six months. Like, how do how can we strategize about ways I can get this type of experience? And obviously, you have to be realistic. If you're in your first year, you can't go and say, oh, I want to first chair a deposition in the next six months. They're going to be like, okay, that's not happening. Like, maybe somebody can take you along and you can sit there and hand them papers. Um, <laughs> you know, that's just kind of how it works. Um so yeah, I think you know you got to be realistic, but you've also got to be advocating for yourself because nobody is really going to be advocating for you. Is the reality of it? 
Another um, opportunity uh, that, that some associates have at certain firms is to shadow people. Um, and I wouldn't discount that, even if you're just going to be somewhere and not doing anything. Uh, it's a really good opportunity to, to see what it's really like and maybe figure out how you're going to get there. And, and, you know, what are the skills this person is using? Like, what do I need to do to, to get to that point? Um, and a lot of times there's a certain amount, a number of hours that are set aside for that. Um, so it's not taking away from your billables. Um, so maybe it's not a ton of hours, but I know that places I've been have had that. So if you, if you've heard about it, um, you know, ask how the shadowing works. Yeah. I mean, one of the places I worked every time that we went to trial, which was actually pretty frequent, uh, they brought along a junior person usually for a couple of days. So, you know, if you're at trial for two weeks, you might have somebody there for two or three days, somebody else for a couple of days, with the idea that they just kind of pitched in and helped out where they were needed, but really it was for their professional development. You know, a lot of people have never been to a jury trial. They've never seen a cross-examination. So these can be super valuable, even if it means, you know, you may have to work a little bit extra later in that week. Absolutely. And I would say that when you're there, um, make sure you're, you know, paying attention and trying to get the most out of it. Um, right. Like you don't want to be the person who's like, oh, you know, I'm tired. I'm going to bed. It's 10 yeah. p.m. We're cool. <laughs> right. And everyone's like, no, we're working until three. So like get in here and make some copies. You know? <laughs> yeah. Try to be useful. I think is good advice, too. Yeah, exactly. Like, you want to pitch in and be the person who's like getting coffee for people. Like, you know, maybe you feel it's beneath you after your, you know, Ivy League legal education. But that's really what your role is at that point. So suck it up and do it. Could not agree more. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you'll, you'll remember the person who was like, oh my gosh, they were so nice. They went out and like, you know, went out to wherever the 24 hour restaurant and brought people food at three in the morning. That person, you know, it's only going to help your Because you're actually helping them. Yeah. And you're so grateful. Yeah. You're just like, oh my gosh, yeah. like we have another set of hands who can do the things that no one else wants to do. This is fantastic. Um, and so maybe when that person needs to give work to someone um, who's more junior, they're going to think of you. Oh, for sure. So I, I think that's a lot of what this is about. Yeah, you want to be that, that go-to person where they think, you know, they did a great job getting me coffee at 3 in the morning. I bet they can <laughs> handle, like, you know, defending this deposition for this minor thing that no one really cares about. Yeah, sure, why not? Um, yeah, so you want to be top of mind. Um, so... Let's talk about law firms. Like, I mean, we talked earlier about how you basically need to be on top of this. But, I mean, do firms try to help you with this stuff? Are they keeping track of things? Are they paying your bar fees? Like, how does this work? Um, So I think all big firms are – they're paying your bar fees. And they're keeping track of, like, their internal CLEs. Um, So, like, we were talking about with the sign-in sheets and things like that. Um. So actually, if you went back and needed to get another copy of certificate from an internal course, it wouldn't be that hard. Um, So I do think you can count on them to do some things. Uh, A lot of times they'll ask you to send them, you know, when the bar fees come in, like the sheet that got sent to you, because it's not going to get sent to the firm. It's going to get sent to you. And again, that part is on you. And weirdly, yeah, weirdly enough in California, I think they don't even mail them anymore. Oh. Yeah, they just kind of stopped mailing them, I think, last okay. year. And suddenly it was like, oh, yeah, you just need to log into the website and pay this. <laughs> and everyone's like, what? <laughs> you know? so you've got well, to- then it might be a different system. Well, the point is, though, you need to make sure that it got paid for you, yeah, you whether better, it's yeah. getting paid by the firm directly or you're getting reimbursed by the firm. The point is that no matter what, you don't want anything to lapse. So if you have to put out the money and get reimbursed, it's more important than it not. Right. And you need to be on top of the paid. deadline. I mean, nobody's going to be like, oh, well, your HR person didn't tell you that you needed to do this. Like you're a lawyer. You need to, you know, go ahead and mark on your calendar for the next 10 years the due date of these fees because they're pretty much always the same. Exactly. Um, And the other thing is uh, if it's a week before the deadline and you all of a sudden look and you need, you know, three quarters of your credits done, you can't go to somebody at the firm and say, why didn't you tell me? (laughs) Yeah, not their problem. (laughs) Yeah. And and I have a feeling that they probably sent out reminders leading leading up to it, you know, to, to tell the lawyers you know, check your CLE, that sort of thing. But whether or not they have, it is all on you. So it's on you to keep track of, you know, all the documentation. And it's also on you to log in and report that you've complied. So aside from the, you know, the bar dues being paid, 
that part where you log in, because I've seen a lot of people be confused about that, that is something you do. You cannot have the firm log into your account for you. Right, or your and secretary say that they did or whatever. Or your secretary. <laughs> That's completely unethical. Yeah, I mean, basically you're certifying, I did this. Um, yeah. You know, you've got to sign off on it, basically. Um, and, you know, it's just one of those things you don't want to leave to the last minute. What if the website crashes? You know, all these ridiculous yeah. things happen. Just it's something you, you really need to deal with over time and also you know it's it, way easier to not have to do it at the last minute yeah so i would say I did calendar it, the- yeah i did it one one year i had like only done half of it or something and i realized maybe a month before and you know that's a lot of hours spent clicking every six minutes on an online presentation to prove that you're still there um mm-hmm. and going to random things that i really didn't have any particular interest in just to get credit you know it's not that overwhelming if you just do it over time but if not it's going to become really a problem um all right well we're about out of time here what type of professional development mistakes do you see young lawyers consistently making well one just on the cla side what we talked about not keeping track of their certificates that happens just on such a wide basis um and that's across the board Um, So I would say, you know, taking ownership of that part yourself. The other big mistake I think is really uh, that they're not keeping track of their professional development from day one. Um, Because these aren't skills that all of a sudden as a seventh year, you should start to like think about. So just one example is networking. I think it's something that uh, you can start from even when you're in law school. Um, Because you don't know where your classmates are going to end up. Like, that they're going to be in-house, that they're going to be a client, they're, they're going to be at the DA's office, right. that's where you want to be. So I would say that networking, to me, is a really big part of your professional development, and it's something that you should do from day one. Yeah, and even conferences, which I mentioned earlier, oftentimes students aren't aware of this, but your law school will actually pay for a conference a lot of the time. So if you see Mm -hmm. an interesting ABA event or some other type of thing that you're like, oh my gosh, that would be so amazing if I was able to go to that, chances are actually pretty high that your school will pay for you to go. So why not take advantage of it? Absolutely. I think that's a great opportunity. Because you're going to meet so many people there. I mean, who knows? you know, from all over the place, all over the country. I feel like this is one of those situations where you almost always want to just say yes, even if you're like, well, I don't know, you know, it could be intimidating. I don't know anyone. Just go. And I also think, you know, um, those those things where it feels intimidating sometimes are the thing that is going to push your professional development. Sure. Um, And and going back to what we talked about before about, um, you know, if someone says, do you want to speak on a topic? Um, or do you want to do this presentation at law school and you're a junior attorney? If, if it's something you feel like you could do, I would say, why not try? Right. Um, that pushes you a little bit. Yeah, and you're going to, I mean, that's the time in your life when you need to be spending that extra effort and extra time to position yourself as an expert and really become an expert. You know, later on, if you're 10 years into practice, you're like, oh, I could do this presentation, you know, off the top of my head. That's probably not the time for you to be doing it. The time for you to be doing it is exactly. when you're like, oh, I'm really going to have to stretch and learn and put this stuff together and improve my public speaking. And it's going to be so hard. Well, that's why you want to do it, because that's going to put you again. That's going to level you up. It's going to put you in a position that's better than other people who are like, yeah, I don't know. I feel like I have enough work already. Thanks. Absolutely. And I think, you know, no one is going to take ownership of your career for you. No, no one's going to do it for you. No, I mean, they can't and they won't. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. basically, if you have a vision for what you want to achieve and where you want to be, it's up to you to execute on that vision. Absolutely. All right. Well, with that, we are unfortunately out of time for more career help and or the opportunity to work one-on-one with us, check out careerdicta.com. If you enjoyed this episode of the Law School Toolbox podcast, please take a second to leave a review and rating on your favorite listening app because we would really appreciate it. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss anything. If you have any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to reach out to Lee or Allison at lee at lawschooltoolbox.com or allison at lawschooltoolbox.com. Or you can always contact us via our website contact form at lawschooltoolbox.com. Thanks for listening and we'll talk soon. Mm-hmm.